morning, everyone. <clears throat> I was think, sitting there thinking of um, five or six years ago, a few of us went to New York City and we, we went to Brooklyn Tabernacle on Sunday and I guess the only way I could describe what happened there when they began their service was an explosion of worship and joy. There was such joy in the place. We had arranged that um, in between services we'd meet the pastor, his name is Jim Simbola. And so we went up and we met with them, and um, remember we said to him, so what's with that? Where does that come from? And he looked at us and he said, Jesus, that's just a Christian answer, Jesus. And we sort of did what you did, and, and he said, no, I'm serious, Jesus. He said, those people, they only have Jesus. He said, they, they, some of those people, he said, they have enough money to get on the subway and come here but they don't even know how they're gonna get home. They trust Jesus for the money to get home. He said, all they have is Jesus, but he's enough. And they're filled with the joy of the Lord. Isn't that cool? Um, So it doesn't, actually, joy does not depend. Here's the good news today. This is the really good news. Joy does not depend on the price of a barrel of oil. Isn't that cool? We have Jesus. Does anybody believe that? Seriously. Like, that's actually true. Um, it, I'm sure it'd be nice if oil went up, but if it doesn't, we still have the Lord. That's good news. That's the good news today. Um, and the, the really good news is that the kingdom of God is advancing in unprecedented ways around the globe, here in Red Deer and right around the world. There's no country in the world that's been in the news more the last year than Greece. It is a broken country. I've been there six times every year for six years, and uh, it is more broken than I've ever seen it. Um, it's been in the news because of their financial situation. It's been in the news now because of the refugee crisis. Um, it's a broken country. Unemployment in Athens for people 30 and under is 50%. Um, and yet, the really good news is God is doing amazing things in that country. I have never seen what I've seen in Greece this last little while. The way the gospel is getting out in Athens and into the outline areas and onto the islands and God is doing amazing things there, here, all around the world. That's the good news. So in some ways, um, it is the best of times and it's the worst of times. Um, That's a great first line from Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities. I was thinking in the first service how great books, they always have great first lines. Did you know that? If it was a really, really good first line, it's a great book. In the beginning, God. Isn't that a great first line? That comes from a really good book. Um, there, there is another, Moby Dick, you know how that starts? Call me Ishmael. That is the best first line for a book like that that you could ever come up with. You gotta know who Ishmael is and, and then you'll know the storyline of Moby Dick. Um, Charles Dickens said it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. This might be the worst of times in some ways, but in other ways, in terms of the gospel, what God is doing, it is absolutely the best of times. And, and I'm excited about that. I want to read you a scripture today um, from the Christmas story. Not one that you'll usually hear on Christmas Eve, but it's from the Christmas story in Matthew chapter 2. And then I want to just add um, a line from Deuteronomy to it. But in Matthew chapter 2, the Magi had just come to visit Joseph and Mary. And it says in verse 13, when they had gone... An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod's going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he'd been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up. Take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel for for those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee and he went and lived in a town 
called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets. He will be called a Nazarene. And then in Deuteronomy um, chapter 10 and verse 19, and the lights are so bright I can't see it. That's my fault, so I'll look it up. Um, read it for me. Read it. What does it say? Thank you. That'll save me finding it. That was really good. Um, you know, when it comes to Christmas and the birth of Jesus, it, um, it's always remembered in soft colors, usually with beautiful music playing in the background. The faithful, which would be us, expect and are generally offered a story limited to joyful angels, excited shepherds, and generous wise men. We sing beautiful carols. I thought of one like Silent Night, Holy Night, all is calm, all is bright. And yet when you think about the Christmas story that Matthew wrote about, um, nothing could be further from the truth than that carol. It was anything but a silent night. It was anything but um, a calm night. It was anything but a bright night, um, really. The reality was very, very different. When God sent his son, Jesus, Emmanuel, he came to a very broken, troubled world. Jesus was born at a time of trouble, tension, violence, terrorism, and fear. And it would be right in one sense, if you're going to get into the Christmas story, to kind of push aside as much as we can all the peaceful Christmas scenes and try and let Matthew tell us what it was really like. Before he learned to walk or to talk, Jesus was a homeless refugee with a price on his head. Um, Matthew makes that abundantly clear in this passage that we just read. And I haven't heard any Christmas sermons or Christmas Eve sermons on this passage, and I've heard quite a few of mine. Um, and, and it's just one that we, we would rather ignore, really. Um, why would Matthew put this bit here? Why would he include this flight to Egypt and this death of all these two-year-old boys in Bethlehem and vicinity? Why would he write this? There's two reasons why. Um, one is a minor point for my purposes today. It's more major in Matthew's book, but for today it's more minor. It would be this. Matthew is deliberately setting Jesus up as the new Moses. He wants to present Jesus as the new Moses who will now free his people in a way Moses never could. And you remember when Moses came, that Pharaoh um, deliberately ordered the execution of all little children. Now you're finding Matthew saying the same thing happens when, when uh, Jesus comes. And we're meant to join the dots between Moses and Jesus. If that's not enough, uh, Matthew will say um, that Jesus and Mary and Joseph went to Egypt and then came back. So out of Egypt, Jesus called his son. That should remind you of Moses and Israel coming out of Egypt. He's deliberately setting up uh, Moses and Jesus and saying that Jesus is the new Moses. What Moses failed ultimately to do, this Moses will do. He will literally free his people from their sins. And anybody that knows Jesus will be free indeed. That's what Moses is going to do. So that's one reason he includes this bit. But the other one, which should be more to my point today, is to remind us that at the beginning of the life of Jesus and at the end, there were terrible brutalities. A mindless, bloody atrocity took place at the birth of Jesus. And at the end of his career, a cross with unspeakable brutality and those two things characterize both the beginning and the end of Jesus' life. In other words, Matthew would say his ministry was in and to a violent world. His ministry was to a world where the depths of evil were so bad that only God himself could answer the issue. And so Emmanuel is presented by Matthew as God's answer to a desperately broken world. And when we think about the brokenness of our world, there's a lot of places we could go here at home. Um, one of the things we've talked about the last couple of weeks that I want to dig into just a little bit this morning is the refugee crisis. Um, it's an issue in our world. It always has been an issue. There always have been refugees, and there always will be. But, but you, you have to almost today add the word crisis to it. 
because it's that big, it's that bad. How are we to think? How are Christians to respond? What does God think? Um, how are we to sort through all the questions that come to our mind? We, we vacillate so often between fear and compassion when it comes to these issues. The question is, how do Christians respond? Governments need to, could, should, uh, hopefully will. But my concern today is the Christian church, people that are followers of Jesus. What do, what do we do? How do we process this? How do we think? How do we act? Those are important questions. Um, just for a minute, just consider the facts that are all around us. Maybe you've read about them. I don't think any of us in this room have witnessed the um, levels of violence that are emptying countries like Syria, where the confounding conflict there involves some 7,000 different armed groups literally emptying the country so that you have hundreds of thousands of Syrian refugees today in, in Lebanon, in Jordan, in Turkey, and coming across the strait from Turkey to Lesbos, one of the Greek islands. Um, the Middle East, more than ever, seems an excellent place to leave behind, and many are. They're leaving for Europe, uh, ultimately, if they can get there. And along with the Syrians or people from Afghanistan, Iraq, and Northern Africa, in terms of the ones that come across from Turkey to Greece as an entry point into Europe, 400,000 have traveled across those waters since June of this year. Um, some 300,000 have drowned that they know of trying to make that journey. Many of them little children. Many children actually drown in the rafts because the rafts are so overcrowded that water comes in and the children um, uh, they just ignore it at the bottom and they drown in the rafts. Um, half of the people that come across are probably 12 and under. 2,500 to 3,000 a day have been crossing that strait since June, um, which means um, the size of Crossroads Church every single day, men, women, children, old people, pregnant, people, uh, pregnant women, they, they all come across in a single day. Um, it's astounding. They pay between $1,000 and $1,200 to the smugglers in Turkey to get on a raft and to come across. Children are about half that amount. Um, they come in inflatables, they come in dinghies, they come in rafts, basically anything that'll get across the strait, they come in. And when you're there, you can see the shoreline littered with the uh, boats and the life jackets that they come across in, because they just leave it all. Oftentimes, they'll take a knife and they'll, they'll cut their inflatable dinghy so that you can't send them back. Um, and so they're, they're there. I wish I could have had a picture for you, but we went down at night to a place where there were tens of thousands of life jackets, mountains of life jackets. It gives you some indication of the, the volume, the, the great um, volume of humanity that comes across there. Everybody at the front end profits from the, uh, the refugees. Um, smugglers uh, make about $5 million a day, and there's about 30,000 smugglers that bring them up through Turkey, get them their life jackets, their boats, put them on and send them across. Um, the smuggling of, of uh, these people to Europe is, uh, is big, big business. A lot of criminals have left other um, jobs and, and now are involved in, in this. Um, people on the island of Lesbos, although up front they would tell you they don't like the crisis, it's a moneymaker, really. Um, they would have no tourism this time of year, but hotels are busy, restaurants are busy, um, car rentals, um, you name it. There's just people making piles of money. Uh, with my friend Todd and a few others, we went down one night, a dark road. I might, have I might have told you this before, but you know the beautiful thing about being my age? I need one sermon, and I preach it all the time, and I think it's a different one every week. So <laughs> if you've heard it, forgive me, but um, the, the, we went down this road. It was a dark road. It was um, quite a ways down, and uh, kind of like a one-lane thing with a cliff on one side and hill on the other. We came across a group of men, and they were just across the road smoking and so on, and we talked to them, and they were waiting for the life rafts to come in at night because what they would do is go down and probably rob them blind and charge them an exorbitant amount just to come up the hill. They were just local Greek men. Everybody makes money on these people. Um, their plight always increases when someone blows themselves up in Paris or somewhere else because it means borders close and fear begins to trump everything else and so their plight just worsens. They, they, um, 
They have GPS coordinates from Facebook on their phones. Uh, they have information from friends that have gone ahead. So when they get off the rafts, they actually begin walking, know exactly where to go and what to do. It's a, an incredible sight to actually see. You know that. Um, you know when you read the news that this is a huge problem in our world. The issue is, what does God think? What are Christians to think? And what are we to do? I, I've, I've been trying to get my head into this. And so what I'd like to do for just a few minutes is just give you a lens, one lens to look through. Not necessarily the only lens, but one lens to look through. It's the lens of Scripture. And I want to just show you what I've, what I've discovered um, as I've looked at this through Scripture um, there's much more, and I hope it'll start lots of conversations and that we can learn together. And on a night like December the 8th, um, we can begin to um, sense how the Holy Spirit's leading us and guiding us to make some difference in this issue in our world. So here, here's what I found. Um, going back to the text I read you from Matthew chapter 2, the first thing that hit me was Jesus was a refugee. That's the first thing I discovered. Jesus was a refugee. He was born during the time of Herod. Herod was an exceedingly complex person. Herod was an Arab, uh, racially. Racially, he was an Arab. He was religiously Jewish. He was culturally Greek. And he was politically Roman. This was a complex man. He was both brilliant and brutal at the same time. He was paranoid about any usurper to his throne. He used to take people out around him all the time. He had married 10 wives, had a lot of sons, um, often would take his sons out because people would see them as, um, as someone that might want to succeed Herod. So he, he took two of his favorite sons out. Um, his favorite wife was called Miriam. You can read all about this in a historian like Josephus and others, but because you probably won't pick up the book this week, I'll just tell you, and then you won't have to. But his favorite wife was Miriam. And he thought that at one point she was conspiring with someone to take him out. So he took her out. And then he realized he still loved her. And he would babble around the palace for a month or two on end, calling out her name and then asking his servants to get her. And they'd come back and say, she's not here. And they would be beaten or taken out. He's a tough guy to be around. When he was dying, he gathered up a lot of the very, very important people in the area and, he, and he, had, he left orders that when he died, they were to be executed because he wanted there to be mourning in the land when he died. And he was smart enough to know nobody would weep when he died. This is Herod. This is exactly when Jesus was born. So you can understand the text a little bit better. When the Magi go to Herod and they say, where is he who is born king of the Jews? And that would put all of Herod, Herod's lights on king of the What? Isn't that me? No, somebody's been born king of the Jews. And so he puts his plan into action right away that he will take out every boy in Bethlehem and vicinity, two years old and younger. Now, the movie industry has made a big deal of this. Um, any child's death is horrible. Probably there wouldn't have been more than 30, 20 or 30. If you go with the population of Bethlehem at the time, which should be uh, less than 1,000 people, probably under two, 20 or 30. But he took them all out. That's the point. Um, God, knowing this, said to Joseph in a dream, Joseph, get up, take the child and its mother, and escape to Egypt. So Joseph and Mary and the boy become refugees. At night, they get up and they just leave. Now, what's intriguing to me about the whole thing is that behind the scenes, there's God. God knows exactly what's going on in the palace, in the manger, everywhere. He's directing all of this um, stuff. And, and the other thing that's interesting to me is he doesn't do anything about Herod. He could take Herod out. Why move Joseph marrying a boy? Why not just take Herod out and, and save a lot of other murders too? Well, he doesn't take Herod out. Why not take all Herod's evil people out that are causing chaos? He doesn't do it. He is behind this movement from Bethlehem to Egypt. Why doesn't God take people out in Syria? Why doesn't God just fix it? I don't know. There's mysteries to divine sovereignty that we live with and don't understand. But God didn't then, and he doesn't now. But what he did do is provide an amazing way for Joseph and Mary and the baby. They, nobody knows, it's guesswork, as to how long they would have stayed in Egypt. 
Uh, the upper end would be two years, the lower end would be a few months, but how would they provide for themselves? Well, how did God provide for them? The wise men gave them gold, myrrh, frankincense. I mean, they had enough to survive for a fairly long period of time in a place like Egypt. So behind it was God, ahead of them was God. Somehow God was in the mix, even though sometimes it's difficult to see, and I don't doubt there's a lot of that um, going on today as well. But I think we need to let that just kind of sit for a minute, that the Son of God was a refugee. The Son of God was a refugee. He can relate to people who were displaced because of war and persecution, people who were fleeing for their lives, seeking refuge from the brutal forces of war and terrorism, because he was there. He was there. He can surely relate to their suffering and hopelessness. And I often think to myself, at the center of the universe is a man, a human Jew, who's also God, who gets it, whose heart is moved with the things that move our hearts and their hearts. Um, knowing Jesus was a refugee changes the faces of refugees for me. Brings down barriers. Helps us see them in a different light and welcome them as we would actually welcome Jesus. So that's the first thing I discovered is that Jesus was always well, a refugee. Second thing I found is that God is a refuge. God is a refuge. Throughout the Bible, from beginning to end, God, God stands as a refuge. It's one of his names. Um, a couple of the most well-known places you'll find it in the Bible are Psalm 46, one, God is our refuge and strength. Another well-known one would be Deuteronomy 33, um, 27, the eternal God is your refuge. What is a refuge? If you, if you looked at the word, it would mean shelter, safe place is what it means. God is a safe place. I was processing that in processing what I wanted to talk about today as I was praying through some of the Psalms and I came to Psalm 142. Um, listen to the words of Psalm 142 at this point. It says in Psalm 142, look to my right and see. No one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. I thought that, you could put that on the lips of somebody in a life raft in, in, on the ocean between Turkey and Lesbos. Uh, look to my right and see, no one's concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. Then he goes on, he says, but I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry, for I'm in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they're too strong for me. I thought, what more relevant way to pray than those words? Now, I know I've told you this a lot before, and I, and I, and I hope I'm telling you this um, when I'm about dead um, for the rest of my life, but the Psalms are given to you and to me to teach us to pray. You don't, ask a, you don't say to a kid, talk. You give them words. God doesn't stand back and say, well, pray, talk to me. He does what we do. He gives people words. The Psalms are the words that you take when you want to say to God, wow, I'm overwhelmed at what you've done. Psalms are what you pray when you want to say to God, I'm so sorry for what I've done. The Psalms are what you pray when you want to say, help. And the Psalms are what you pray when you want to say, thank you. Wow, help, thank you, sorry, captures the Psalms. As I was praying this this week, I realized I really don't know how to pray for refugees, but here's the words that God gives us so that we can pray. So I began to pray, Lord, look. Look to the right and the left of these people. There is no one that's concerned for their lives. No one cares. They don't have a refuge. I began to pray, Lord, would you hear their desperate cry for their in desperate need? Would you listen? Would you bend down to listen? Would you do something? Would you be their refuge? Because God is a refuge, and it's always for the helpless and the hopeless that God stands as a refuge. Um, and then I realized that for all of us, God is a refuge. Um, we may not be in their plight physically, but I, I, re I was reminded of Jesus' words in 
Matthew chapter 11, um, there are powerful words where, where Jesus, he, he just looks out at all these people and he says to them, come to me, come to me, he says, all you who are, are weary and burdened and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I'm gentle and humble in heart and you'll find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Like he says to every weary person, some of you are weary trying to make a relationship work. Some of you are weary trying to keep your head above the water financially. Weary looking for work. Weary, tired, broken, whatever. And Jesus stands there and says, I'll be your refuge. I'll be a safe place. Just just come. However you can get to me, he says, come. However you can get to Jesus, get to him. And he'll be your refuge. You know what he says? I'll show you God's heart. When you come to me, I'll show you that God's heart is gentle. It's humble. He's not just waiting to blot you out like a bug. He's not waiting to condemn you. He's gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find that if you come to me, and you'll find rest for your souls. Anybody can go to Jesus and find him to be a refuge, a safe place from what they're going through, even from their sin. The sin, the chaos that'll take you out eternally if you don't deal with it, you can just come and dump it on Jesus. And he'll handle it. And he'll be your refuge, even from your own stuff. Jesus was a refugee. God is a refuge. And then the other thing I discovered, which I'll just um, trace out for you briefly, is that, I just put it this way, we are responsible. We are responsible. I couldn't get away from that as I read Scripture. Responsible for what? Well, number one, responsible for seeing behind the headlines. Um, That means, as Christian people who follow Jesus, we're responsible to to know his heart and his words so that we think properly, which means to know the book he wrote. So we think his thoughts after him, so we follow in his footsteps. Um, It's so easy to just think about these crises in the way the world thinks about them and not the way Jesus thinks about them. How do you, how do, you do that? Well, you read his book and, you know, one of the, one of the things I mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago in Habakkuk chapter one and verse five, there's a scripture there as relevant today as it was the day it was written where he says to Habakkuk, Habakkuk, look at the nations, watch and be utterly amazed for I'm gonna do something in your day that you wouldn't believe, Habakkuk, even if I told you now. Habakkuk was concerned because nations were in turmoil and peoples were moving here and there. Habakkuk said, God, what are you doing? God said, it's gonna be amazing. And then, and then God said, y- you know, it's gonna go from bad to worse. You think the wor- it's worse, worse is coming, Habakkuk, but I want you to know my end game. And in Habakkuk 2.14, he says, here's my end game, Habakkuk, that the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's where I'm going, Habakkuk. That's what's behind the movement, Habakkuk. That's, what behind, that's what's behind the, the rise and fall of nations. I am working it out so that my glory will fill the planet as the waters cover the sea. And you know what? That's still God's end game. He hadn't completed it in Habakkuk's day and he hasn't completed it yet, but that's where he's going. I don't get it, but that's what he's doing. I have to look through that lens when I look at my world. And you know what I see? I see and hear people that are hearing the good news of Jesus Christ that would never hear it any other way. I've been on the island of Lesbos and I've been in Athens and I've talked to people who share the good news of Jesus with people coming off of life rafts and download Bibles on their phones. I've heard of the Christian church in Germany in particular that rolls up their sleeves and they go out and they meet them and they greet them and they feed them, and they clothe them, and they welcome them in Jesus' name. There are people learning about God's love today that would never hear about it if what's happening hadn't happened. I don't get it, but I see it. And I praise God for the fact that the gospel goes forward in ways I could never think of. Um, So I think I'm responsible to try and get behind the headlines and say, God, can you show me? I I know I'll never understand everything, but can you show me something that helps me process what's actually going on? And then I think we're responsible to practice hospitality. Um, I read Matthew 25, for example, and, and Jesus just lays on all Christians, 
Feed the hungry. If they're thirsty, give them a drink. If they need clothes and they're naked, clothe them. Just do it. That's what he says. I know that the government should figure this out, but, but we have maybe 200, that's the word on the street, of Syrian refugees. They'll be the ones out of Lebanon, out of Beirut, coming to Red Deer. And then I hear Jesus' words, feed them, clothe them. Tell them I love them. And I thought to myself, what if? I mean, just, just imagine. I know this is just imagination, but what's wrong with that? Um, what if, what is there in Red Deer? Eight, 9,000 Christians maybe? Christ followers? No, that you, maybe, I don't know. Um, what if these people that were overwhelmed with fear and terror and violence and persecution and were landed on the streets of Red Deer and were overwhelmed with a tsunami of love and compassion and care and welcome. It'd be amazing if that happened. I need to pray, God, prepare my heart. You need to pray that. We need to figure this out. Because what I know is that we're responsible to do something in Jesus' name. It was Pastor James Cho, our junior high pastor, that just blew my mind on this this week. And this is his. I, 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 I asked him if I could use it, but it's his. He said, Dan, I was thinking about the refugee situation this week, and he said, the Lord said to me, James, go read about Elisha. And he said, I went to Second Kings and I read about Elisha. And he said, you should check this out, and I did. It's amazing. Second Kings chapter six, it starts kind of, the king of Aram was at war with Israel. You know who Aram was? Syria, that's Syria. These evil Syrians were at war with Israel. They were gonna nuke them, take them out. And they were all looked at by Israel as terrorists, these Syrians. And so they were marching against God's people. And God's people were afraid, shaking in their boots. Um, interesting, isn't it? The most common command in the Bible is fear not. The most common problem Christians have is fear. It's hard to figure out. Um, but anyways, um, they're marching. And they come in, they, they meet Elisha. And Elijah says, oh, no big deal. And he just blinds them all with God's power. It just Blinds them all. They're all blind, this whole army. I don't know, 200,000 soldiers blind. That's a bad day if you're an Air, uh, Syrian uh, in those days. So then he goes to the commander and he says, hey, I know who you're looking for, follow me. And, he, and he, somehow he gets all these blind soldiers and he brings them right into Jerusalem to the king of Israel. And the king of Israel is like, man, this is a, I've, I've won the lottery. We can kill them all right here. 200,000, nah, we can take them out right here. They're all blind. You know what Elisha said? What God said through Elisha? Don't do it. Sounds like God. Don't do it. He said, feed them. Make a feast for them. Practice hospitality and send them on their way. And that's what they did. That sounds so much like Jesus. Love your enemies. Do good to those that persecute you. Pray for them. Just be like me, Jesus says. Isn't that cool? So th this... This isn't rocket science. Um, ask God what he thinks. Practice hospitality. Open our homes. Open our hearts. And pray. Pray. Use the Psalms. Ask God to show you some Psalms that you could pray on their behalf. There's a lot of them there. I'd like to end with us praying. So would you stand with me? And you know what I find helpful sometimes um, when it comes to things like this? I find it helpful to have a written prayer. I don't know if you ever write your prayers out, but when, when, you, when you're sort of trying to um, say something to God that's hard, just start writing and, and, and write a prayer and pray it that way. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pray. When you see the line in bold, Lord have mercy, let's all pray it together. Just together we'll say, Lord have mercy. And um, we'll just pray for these people and their plight. So Lord, have mercy for those caught in conflict whose lives hang in the balance, we cry out, Lord, have mercy. For those who cannot escape, trapped by war raging around them, paralyzed by fear, faced with an, an impassable ocean, we cry out, Lord, have mercy. For those who flee, leaving behind all that they've known, venturing into new and strange places, we cry out, Lord, have mercy. For those who are here at the end of a perilous journey, now faced with a new uncertain path, we cry out, Lord, have mercy. Merciful God, help us to act with compassion, to welcome with love, to put the needs of our neighbors before our own, inspire us to pray, 
to act, to, the be, to be the people of hope that you call us to be. Hear us as we cry out for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.